very um, pleased to be here in New York with this film. This, the film is based in New York, so you know, the, the movie's coming home, really. Similar to the, um, the debut of Hunger in the Belfast Northern Ireland. Like, they feel that this is after Total Oil, it's one sort of Venice, yes, 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 but this is the, the real sort of um, place where I actually wanted to show the film. Um, okay, well, the beginning of, of, of Shame was just. Um, it started with a conversation with myself and Abby Morgan. Um, we had an arrangement to meet, I didn't even know my Abby at all. Um, we, we, we arranged them in a, in a cafe. Um, we only had an hour, both of us sort of uh, grabbing time. It ended up in a three, and a three hour and a half conversation. We were still talking. And through that conversation, about talking about the internet, talking about, you know, uh, sort of, come up with the internet and stuff and, and, such, and such like. Then this sort of film <coughs> idea started to snowball from there. I mean, after Hunger, I had, I had no real desire to make another film because it was such an exhausting experience. I think myself and Michael, I don't know, I, I, mean, I know you, you were extremely exhausted, but after I just got sort of the, sort of, uh, the, the, the fatigue of all this research and stuff was affecting me as such, and I thought, you know, I, I had no desire to sort of go through that thing again. But obviously, with this meeting with Abby, that's when it started happening again, this sort of the desire to sort of, the whole idea of feature film, the whole idea of, of storytelling. And uh, what, what um, and you mentioned the internet and some other things, but uh, what specifically that the idea of, uh, of addiction appeal to you if you see it as a film about addiction? Well, it was just the, the whole idea of, um, I mean, you think of films like The Lost Weekend, you think of films like sort of, um, you know, A Man with a Golden Arm, and you have this thing about, what, what, what attracted me about this particular addiction was to do with, in order to facilitate this addiction, you need to have another person needed someone to facilitate that addiction. So therefore, they have drama in a nutshell, really. And that, it hadn't been sort of look, looked at properly in a, in a, in a way. I, it, that was no, obviously another attraction. But also, what happened was this. We started off in London. You know, this, I didn't want to come to New York to make a film. That's not my, that was never my desire. The desire was to make a film about this particular subject matter. And we started in London. But guess what? No one wanted to talk to us. No one wanted to have that conversation with us. So it was very difficult. Um, and all of a sudden, we, you know, we started hit, hit, hitting walls. So we, we went, I, and I asked to speak to some kind of specialist in the field. That specialist, the two specialists we spoke to who actually happened to be in New York. <laughs> and we were over and spoke to them. And then that's how we got access to people who had had the affliction and um, dealing with the affliction of sex addiction. And from there, it just snowballed again. Okay, or well, well, New York. Okay, let, let, let's go here. Let, let's make the film here then, because people are willing to speak. You know, with obviously the encouragement, the encouragement of these two sort of the, um, experts in the field. Um, and it was just amazing, just discoveries. And you know, it's it, you know, it, it was it was it was almost like freaks, one of us. It didn't feel alien at all. It didn't feel sort of sort of oh, you know. Bizarre or absurd, it felt very extraordinary human. It's just, it's just never high. And uh, Michael, can can you talk about? Um, well, first of all, were you were you eager to work with Steve again after the collaboration on Hunger? And and you know we know um, if I can if I can ask this in a way that doesn't sound like it's a joke line. You know, for Hunger, you obviously did an incredible physical transformation to prepare for the role and, and actually star yourself, much like Bobby Sands. What did you do as an actor to prepare <laughs> to play this role? <laughs> really? <laughs> um, I just went out and had a lot of sex and um, you know, just tried to sort of uh, embrace it as best I could. Um, no, um, uh, Working with Steve, uh, you know, was uh, something, you know, that <laughs> I said, I said to, to Steve, you know, at the end of, of Hunger, you know, obviously, he, you know, he changed my life, um, literally, I mean, definitely uh, in terms of a, a, a professional point of view, you know, I was getting to a point, you know, when I was 30 years old, and the recession was just around the corner, which meant literally you know, the same as every other industry, less jobs for less actors, and for somebody to take a chance on, you know, a, a, a non, unknown actor, you know, and to, to, to give them the opportunity to, and take the risk to, to play a lead in, in the film, you know, that there was less and less of that happening. 
So, you know, we, we um, other than a sort of, I think, a big argument the first day of, of, of hunger, <laughs> We, we I remember it well. <laughs> 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 uh, I think, you know, we, we just sort of, I don't know, it was that, that, it's that thing that you always, I remember when I was 17 and I started off doing this, oh, and, yeah, you know, my dream was to meet a director uh, and have a relationship with a director that, you know, the things that I sort of looked at were Scorsese, De Niro, Lumet, Pacino, and, you know, that, that would be the ultimate, you know, to sort of have a sort of, uh, collaboration like that, and to be on a wavelength that powerful with somebody, and you know that you know that's sort of what I was so lucky to sort of find in Steve with hunger. So again, you know, I think um, you mentioned it to me in 2008 that this was sort of you know you had this idea, and um, and I was like, fine, just tell me when and where, and you know I didn't even need to see a script, so it's, it was that simple really. And preparation, um, I did a lot of sort of. <coughs> Just reading, I spend a lot of time with the script, pretty much the same with um, my preparation for most other jobs. I spend a lot of time with the script, and through rereading, rereading, rereading the script, lots of sort of things just, I don't know, it's sort of the, the, the character and the story starts to unravel itself, it starts to sort of, I don't know, set into my enamel. Uh, and then, you know, meeting people helps, of course. Um, I always find it difficult when you meet people in the same situation I found when we were doing Hunger. Um, asking people direct questions didn't really work that well for me in both scenarios, but I always try and get people to tell me stories. I like stories, I like to tell them, I like to hear them. And when people tell stories, they sometimes let their guard down, and through that you can sort of get little, um, uh, like footnotes almost, little sort of uh, motivations. You can see where sort of the, the essence of a personality is. and. Um, and that was very helpful in terms of getting into that headspace, you know, the character who can't really deal with intimacy, somebody who doesn't really like themselves, well, doesn't like themselves at all, really, and so sets about sort of abusing themselves. So that's pretty much, I think, the answer to your question. Can, can you also talk a little bit about building your relationship with, uh, with Carrie Mulligan in the film? I think uh, one of the things that's very impressive in the film is you sense a real shared history between those two characters, even though not a lot of information is actually spoken about, you know, what happened to them, where they come from. Uh, it, did you sort of, as actors, build your own character histories and figure out the backstory of these characters together, or did, uh, did Steve provide a lot of that? How, how was that worked out? Well, you know, again, that was like a really clever um, decision, and I don't, both Steve and, and Abby's to sort of make them, you know, to have siblings. <coughs> There's a real honesty between sort of siblings, I think, and a, and a, and a real cruelty as well. You know, um, they, although the, the, there's a very strong sort of bond, but also there's um, there's an awareness of all the weak, you know, the weak points and how to hit them and how to really strike home. It was interesting because myself, Carrie, Michael, both have siblings or got in sex, so that was a, a, a interesting starting point as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, <coughs> please don't interrupt me again. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, <yes. laughs> so you know, we, <laughs> we, we, uh, we sat down, of course. You know, we sat down, the three of us, and um, and we discussed about you know where these people are coming from. You know, of course, uh, where they are in their lives when we sort of meet them in the film. What's happened before. A biography, for me, is always an important thing to do anyway. Um, <clears throat> you know, to sort of just get an idea and have a confidence of the character. And um, yes, we discussed we, we discussed a lot of that and sort of um, how far we wanted to go with it. And we did some a little bit of workshopping with some scenes. And um, and then I also didn't want to sort of spend too much time with Carrie as well because I wanted to keep um, that element of sort of uh, uh, awkwardness, or s I don't know how to how to describe it, but uh, that the, the sort of um, yeah, like so there a, a certain element of tension and unsurety, rather. That's the word that I'm looking for. I wanted to sort of preserve that, and I think Steve felt the same. We did we did a couple of workshops, and it's like okay, that's enough. You know, let's just wait until you know we get to the, the day of filming. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, 
you, sir. There. question about uh, this viewer it says he uh, it feels there is a strong incestuous undercurrent in the film between the siblings and uh, was that intentional and then can you talk about uh, the boundaries that they that they have with each other um, again um, you know obviously they of the opposite sex uh, brother and sister I mean obviously the, the, the background has to play in that in their relationship and in their sort of the sort of uh, in their intimacy and also in their sort of um, opposite way they sort of in the, in the, in the sort of um, how can I say the sort of uh, the tension as such it, it, it's a, the, the background to sort of, to sort of extend that I it, I just it's one of those things where it's 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 in the air it's, it, it, you you know you 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 meet people you see something in the air you see what's what's going on but you you can't really put your finger on it it's like a wet piece of soap you have I don't know. Uh, like this, you, know? you have a grab, but no, it's not that. It's the, you know, it, it's constantly moving, constantly adjusting, and that's that, 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 that's that's life, I think. And also, you know, you, you, you can smell it, but you can't taste it. You can taste it, you can't smell it. It's there, but it's not there. And that's why I wanted to sort of have that history. It, 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 the history presents itself in the present, in different guises, and I think that's that's what I wanted really. Uh, yes, Jennifer. Hi. Um, I wonder, I, I, there's a very uh, great tension here between inner and outer life, I found, in the film. There's a comment about the size of your forehead uh, in the film. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm wondering whether um, that, uh, I mean, that there is an extraordinary external, uh, internal life that's going on. I wonder um, how you... Uh, where you go in there, if you can articulate that. I mean, how does it, how does that, that thought process begin to germinate for you, and where does it take you? And, and to follow that up, um, I wonder whether th there's also a kind of like a, a psychological gesture that goes on with you that seems very connected with that, um, the moment where you start moving your leg, for example. I mean, it's just like... It, it sizzles. I, I don't know how to how to describe it any other way. Sorry, this is taking too long. The the um, I mean my comments taking too long. The but but you you also seem to back that up with kind of like a psychological space um, that seems to no that seems, no for you for you that, in, that image wise that, that there's a location that's psychologically connected. The image is connected to what's going on with him internally, and I wonder how how that manages to come together so well in the film. Well, it's, partly, it's partly a question for Michael about uh, how he develops the character's internal life and some of his psychological gestures. And somewhere in there, something about the size of his forehead. And, <laughs> and there is a... And, and there's Steve, how he marries sort of the, the, space, the spaces in the film, the visual plan of the film, to what's going on internally in the character. <coughs> Um, okay, uh, it, it's very simple, you know, if I'm not saying anything, um, I am saying something, I mean, my lips just aren't moving, so I've got, an, I've got a dialogue going on all the time, it's like, you know, even if I'm sort of saying to you, you know, it's like, um, hey, where were you last night, but I know that you were somewhere that, I, you know, I didn't like, or whatever, you know, there's a subtext always going on, it might say one thing, mean something else, so in those scenes where I'm not saying anything, I've still got a dialogue going on, it's just my lips aren't moving, and um, and that just keeps sort of um, sort of me connected to what's going on beat by beat, you know. And the one space, yeah. But space as it's related to what's going on internally and psychologically with the character. I mean, the, the I, I, I think I, I lost you. I think I lost you. Um, um, uh, 
that's quite a term, of course. Um, this tool about <coughs> the apartment, um, for example, as, as far as space is concerned. Um, you know, going to a, a New York apartment where he can afford, you can do a lot of research on that. Um, and what was interesting about that was it's, it's so damn small for, for, for the money. But at the same time, it, you know, this is a guy who um, hasn't a lot of time to decorate furniture or whatever. It's very practical. And um, what was interesting for me was that most, a lot of the New York, New Yorkers, a lot of people live in Manhattan, live and work in the sky. As long as yourself in Europe, that's kind of, oh, you live and work in the sky. A lot, a lot of New Yorkers. And it's not that idea that he's above it all, he's, 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 but at the same time, there's a perspective onto the world, for example, in the office and whatnot. So there's this really strange sort of uh, way of sort of pushing the one on wide, on the widescreen format. But you can always have relationships with, with, with not just the, the actual participant in the film, but also in, in its surroundings. So you always have that dialogue. You know, two and two can actually make four because all, it's always in relationship to something else in the brain. And uh, the, the working with those the reflections and uh, working with that kind of space because you know, the, the, these spaces are very, you know, geometrical. It's glass, steel, white wall. It's very cold in a way. I mean, you, you can bring little things, put on the computer to make it a little bit more homely, but it really is what it is. Quite cool. <coughs> Um, this may not be the most obvious question about a film with so much skin, but I'm very curious about the costumes. Uh, your choices <laughs> of costumes seem to be, um, there seems to be a gender divide. Uh, Brandon is dressed <coughs> impeccably the whole time, whereas the women all seem to in some way mirror the sister in the messiness, in the coats, in the scarves. Uh, am I completely, I see your face completely wrong. And <laughs> second part. Um, I'm thinking about what you're saying. I'm thinking, uh, no, I, I don't see that. No, I don't see that. But also, you know, unfortunately. Elizabeth. Yeah, very. Yeah. Elizabeth's character, the woman that's, uh, you know, that uh, Brandon picks up in the bar. Mm. The woman that Brandon picks up in the bar, uh, you know, she's impeccably dressed. She's obviously a businesswoman. Um, uh, Marianne is very beautifully dressed. I mean, you know, you ladies, you're lucky you have a choice. Often okay, you've got, you know, a suit. <laughs> so, you know, you're very, you know, you know variable in your clothing. So that, that's it. Nothing to do with the messiness at all. Far from it. But stylishness. Absolutely. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, I was sort of curious when we said earlier, you mentioned the distance you were getting home with the top. In what meaning? You said you moved to New York because you were getting resistance. It wasn't a resistance. People just didn't want to talk. No, uh, again, I, you know, people, you know, they're, they're living their lives, and the people don't want to talk, but the people in, in New York, uh, we, we, we got access to people who wanted to talk. And there was difficulty for <coughs> access to want to talk in London, that was all. The resistance, just unfortunately, that was what happened. Uh, here? Yeah. Okay. Quick question, when you are based on such a single line, we're not bad persons who come from a fucked up place. It's a question about the, the line in the film, we're not bad people, we just come from a fucked up place, and this viewer is, is suggesting that uh, perhaps that uh, because they come from Ireland that they may have been uh, victims of incest. We love incest in Ireland. And the Catholic Church. So. <laughs> And what it was to do in some ways was I wanted to make the, their background familiar rather than um, sort of mysterious in any way. And of course people say, what do you mean by it being familiar, not mysterious, not telling anything about their background? But actually what I'm doing is when people come to the cinema and sit down, they bring in all their luggage, they bring all their baggage, they bring all their history and their past to the cinema. And they're looking at people who are having conversations and they, you're, you're projecting what the possibilities of what could have happened with Sissy and Brandon. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a, a, a situation where it's more familiar to each, in, each individual here rather than mysterious or rather than you know, sort of uh, some long yarn about what happened or what could have happened. So it was much more closer to, to the audience, in fact. Mm -hmm. And Brandon. Um, since it mentioned there that this was from a story that you had collaborated on with someone else. Abby Morgan. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about the evolution of the, of the, 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 the script? And <coughs> How you came to this one, and were there other versions and other uh, elements that w were that we don't see on the screen, but we're in the process? 
Chris, question about the evolution of the screenplay from the initial meetings with Abby Morgan to the version that we see now in the film. I mean, what we did was we followed the, no, the film, the, the wind carried us, honestly, because we're one of those situations where this is a, this is a, 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 a I wanted the responsibility of, of, of this film. I wanted the responsibility of this particular subject matter. And with that responsibility comes sort of a, a, a real a mag a sort of meticulous research and also talking and actually what would happen, what would happen to this character, talking to, to, to all, the, all these people who are involved in, in, in this particular um, uh, affliction, you know, their, 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 their sexcapades, their, their downs, their ups, and so forth and whatnot. They were the ones who guided us. In, in making of this of, of, of this story in this film, and um, what would happen if this person was in this, this particular situation? What would happen then? What would happen then? So it was all about the detail, all about the research. It's all about research, and um, you know, it, 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 you know Billy Wilder's um, uh, Lost Weekend and, and, and how how shocking that was when it first came out. Talk about the alcoholic. Well, I imagine you know again, I you know obviously I'm not comparing my film to the Lost Weekend, but it's the same to do with sex. And, and it's another outlet to have a, a certain kind of high, and this is what's happening right now. It's not a, it's not made up. You know, it's happening in New York City, it's happening in London, it's happening all over. It's not a, a fantasy. It's, it's, it's actually a, an absolute reality. And some people's glasses are half full, and some people's glasses are half empty. It's a fact.